Okay, 617, we'll call the meeting to order. I pledge to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Roll call, please. We have 17 supervisors present. Uh, supervisors Grady, Rose, Belsky, Kubicki, Franco, and Caro are excused. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with the presentation of the 2023 Employees Racial Equity Assessment Report. Uh, this is just going to be a presentation. We're not going to take any questions. And uh, it's... Uh, if you guys have any questions, then uh, you can contact Clara, you know, at a later date. But that will give you something to think about it and see what you want to do. At this time, Clara. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Good evening to the members of the County Board. In 2021, we launched the Kenosha County Employee Racial Equity Assessment Survey, and we presented those results to the County Board that fall. At that time, we said we would repeat the survey to measure our progress, and this was done last summer. This evening, we're here to share those results with you. You each have a report on your desk, in the limited time that we have this evening, our presenter will go through just a portion of those pages to give you a high-level summary of the results and help you understand how to interpret the report. The slides on the screen will indicate the corresponding page number in your printed report for reference. You'll see it at the bottom center of the slide. This survey was once again conducted by the Racial Equity Group. I'm very pleased to have here in person this time James Bird Guess, the president of Racial Equity Group. So a little more about Bird. He is the president of Racial Equity Group and has over a decade of management consulting experience. His areas of expertise include conducting racial equity assessments, advising executives on diversity and inclusion strategies, designing and delivering racial equity training curriculum, integrating equity into organizational policies and practices, and ultimately making racial equity standard operating procedure. He uh, is a published author of four books, and his fifth book, Bigger Than Racism, is due out in November. So with that, I will turn it over to Bird. Thank you, Claire. And just let me say um, good evening to the Committee of the Whole, uh, Kenosha County. Um, thank you all for having me and being able to share with you all an update uh, on, this, uh, on this report. If you look at page um, four uh, in the report, uh, we won't read through all of that word for word. I know you all can read, but this report was really about trying to establish a baseline and a benchmark for the county in terms of making sure that there's equal opportunity for everyone. Equal opportunity to be employed, equal opportunity to obtain contracts, uh, equal opportunity just to live and have access to services uh, for the county. And, and that's really what this report tries to establish by measuring the county against evidence-based um, uh, competencies that we were gonna be looking at. But that's really how the county is defining what racial equity means. It's equal opportunity uh, through all the, the, throughout the county's operations. And that's what we were attempting to, uh, to measure in these last two reports starting in 2021, baseline year, and then coming back again in 2023, 
uh, to track our progress going forward. If you look on page six, go back here, on, on your report, you will see a list of the competencies that we were looking uh, towards uh, measuring. So we asked all employees countywide, uh, there's six competencies that we wanted to assess. So 34 questions were tied to six competencies. And those six competencies are institutional commitment is one. This is where we look to see if an organization has what's called accountability structures in place. In other words, is there an equity officer or some type of diversity uh, dedicated position to monitoring the progress for racial equity, diversity, inclusion? Uh, as well as there a task force or a committee in place? Now we know based on research that having those two structures in place uh, are usually, um, uh, you tend to get to see organizations make progress uh, in this work um, for equal opportunity. We're also looking to see if leadership commitment is another competency. So we want to make sure that managers and leaders are not just saying one thing, they value equity and inclusion and doing another. They don't let anyone go to training on it. Uh, so we want to see if they're uh, taking ownership, setting goals, do they look at data to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity, whether it's employment, whether it's promotions, whether it's compensation, um, whether it's their services and programs. So we look to see if there's a leadership commitment as well. That's another competency. A third competency is what's called capacity building. This is, this is where we know that uh, when it comes to racial equity, the county cannot uh, address this by itself as an organization. There, we look to see are there external collaborative partnerships in place, such as with, uh, it could be with community nonprofit organizations who have a shared purpose for racial equity. It could be with colleges and universities uh, that, uh, that target, um, uh, that serve minority populations. So it's, in other words, does the county have relationships with these external uh, organizations to try to advance racial equity for the county as a whole. Could be workforce development agencies, just a variety of different ones. We look to see how strong those relationships are. Another competency is data and disparities. What I like to say when it comes to racial equity, a lot of people have a lot of uh, different opinions on what racial equity diversity inclusion is. But sometimes it can be very misguided. And what I like to say is if you don't have data, then really all you have is an opinion about racial equity, diversity, inclusion. And so we like to really lead with data, get what the facts say about the county as a whole, and let the data drive us in terms of policies and practices. So we look to see, first of all, you can, you, as, a, as an organization, we really don't know if inequities exist unless we're collecting data. Data by race, ethnicity, uh, gender, uh, and other demographics uh, uh, groups that we want to look at. Um, now, primarily, the, amount, the data that's available that's provided by the federal government primarily is race, ethnicity, and gender data. There's not a lot of data, particularly on individuals' with disabilities, uh, sexual orientation, LGBTQ+, and other different groups. But the federal government has made it a priority to focus on having data in terms of employment uh, for race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, and so we look to see if the county is collecting data, is it analyzing data to know if inequities exist. And let's be, uh, let me define what inequity means. There's a difference between a disparity and an inequity. When you have a disparity, let's say I'll use the gender pay disparity all across the United States, you, know, you, hear, the, you, hear, the, um, you hear the disparity that women, for every $1 a man makes, women may make 80 cents. That's a disparity. Now you want to see how large that disparity is. Now if it's a significant disparity and it's persistent over time, we would define that as an inequity. And when you see significant disparities, and in terms of being um, really substantial, what that probably is telling you is that this disparity is not um, happening by chance alone. Something else is driving it. So for example, using the same gender pay disparity analysis, if you look to see that um, women are significantly paid less than men, even when you control for education, experience, qualifications, then you know something else must be driving that. Maybe it's bias, maybe it's gender discrimination or something like that. So that's, you'd want to determine that for racial inequities as well. Do you see significant disparities by racial groups in different areas uh, where the county uh, has operations? And the last two, belonging and inclusion. 
Uh, belonging and inclusion. Do all employees have a sense of belonging and inclusion when they work for the county, their experiences? Can they be, them, be themselves? Do they have to downplay their culture or who they are in order to feel like um, they, they uh, in order to work for the county? Um, you want to be able to get a sense of how everyone uh, feels. And then the last one, knowledge and competence. <coughs> Do employees know why the county should even be focused on racial equity? Do they know how racial equity um, fits into their jobs? You know, you have some people say, hey, I work in accounting. Uh, racial equity, that's normally HR's job. Or I work in the public works department. What, do I, what does that have to do with racial equity? Uh, so it's really getting everyone to understand and, and measuring, do they understand how racial equity fits into their particular department? And we want to ask employees that because then you're able to target training or target your communication so that everyone is in alignment uh, with what this means and what it looks like. So those are the six competencies that we wanted to measure uh, the county on with the questions that we ask. Now we're going to go ahead and move into our next slide. Oops. And this will show us the, the scoring results on page 10 uh, in your report. So on page 10, you're going to see a continuum at the bottom of the page. That is um, a continuum of how strong the commitment level is for the county. So when we design this framework, these 34 questions tied to these six competencies, and we asked all the employees countywide, how would you rate the county on a scale of one to five? Use the five point Likert scale. Whether you strongly disagree all the way to you, do you strongly agree that the county is, is, um, has these policies or practices in place and they're doing these things. And with that, with the rating, we can determine where the county fail, uh, usually in one of four categories. Uh, it's a continuum, though, so it's not just standard cut, slice and dice into these four, but there's a cutoff point thresholds. Colorblind institution, a cautious institution, a compliant institution, or a committed institution. Um, the difference, well, I'll start with the compliant. Many organizations, municipalities that start this work, a lot of times will fall right into what we call a compliant institution. Compliant institutions are institutions that are normally reactionary to this. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, after the George Floyd tragedy, tragedy, we had a lot of public and private sector organizations reacted uh, in a way where they hired their first chief diversity officer. They said, we have to do this, we have to do that. The only reason they did that is was out of a reactionary to some type of event that occurred. Uh, sometimes when someone complains to the human resource departments about harassment, then all of a sudden the human resource department will react and send everyone to harassment training. Uh, so some, a lot of institutions start off as being compliant. A committed institution does not wait for an event to take place. They know, they equip all of their employees with training because they know that if their diverse forces, uh, is, if their uh, workforce is diverse, they want to equip their employees for knowing how to be able to interact with each other, how to understand and, and interact with people who are different than you, whether it's race, ethnicity, age, religion, whatever, whatever the demographics may be. Um, they automatically collect data, they analyze data. Uh, because they're aware that inequities do exist all throughout the United States, as well as in Kenosha County. So they're more proactive, they're not reactive. That's the difference between a compliant institution and a committed institution. In 2021, the aggregate score, as you see here, is 3.66 for the county. Now that's the aggregate score. When you're, when you're uh, doing racial equity work, it's important to disaggregate the data, which we'll show you here in a moment. Disaggregate just simply means we want to break it out uh, uh, by demographic groups as much as possible. The year 2023 score was a 3.72. Again, that's the aggregate score. Um, so the county um, fell into a co compliant institution stage uh, uh, in, in, that, in that particular stage. Now we'll move on to our next page. It'll be page uh, 12 in your report. We want to, I want, we want to show you what the individual competency scores were year over year. So in 2021, as well as in 2023, uh, the lighter blue bar that, uh, represents the 2021, and the dark, darker navy blue represents 2023 scoring for each of the six. I'm sorry, for, yeah, for each of the individual competencies. So as you can see, the strongest competency overall uh, for 2021 and 2023 was belonging and inclusion. 
uh, right at 3.94 and 3.99. What that's telling us is that overall, uh, employees have a strong sense of belonging and inclusion. They feel like they can be themselves when they work for the county. They don't have to downplay it or hide how they are different, uh, their cultural identity. They feel like they can be who they are. Um, now again, this is the aggregate results. This is overall. Then you, the next highest uh, competency was knowledge and competence. Uh, here the county showed strong aggregate results. Employees know why the county should even be focused on racial equity. They understand what racial, inequ what racial inequities look like in their departments. Um, they, they know how to recognize bias and how bias impacts social interactions as well as how they serve the public. So that we were strong in those areas. You see the greatest opportunity in the aggregate results is data and disparities. So here, employees may not necessarily know though um, that the county is collecting data by race, ethnicity, gender, and other groups and analyzing that data. And so this report also serves as a indicator of transparency and communication uh, to, all, to all employees. Hey, are we, are we collecting this data? Are we being transparent with this data? Um, so here uh, is showing that uh, this is our greatest opportunity in terms of data and disparities with the aggregate results. And then we will move to oops. Get stuck there. There we go. All right. We'll move to page 22 now in your report. Page 22. So when you ask all the employees countywide, how would you rate the county on these competencies for advancing racial equity? One thing to look at is to see if there's race ethnicity consensus. In other words, how did white employees rate the county versus how employees of color rated the county on the same questions for the same competencies? Were they in alignment or was there a significant amount of divergence? Uh, this is for 2023, as you can see, uh, for five out of the six competencies, uh, if you look to the left, where, uh, left, far left column where it says gap, where anywhere you see an asterisk by the number, that tells you how large the gap is, and the asterisk tells you if it's a statistically significant gap as well. So any gap that's greater than 0 .20 is considered statistically significant. Uh, so you, you can see um, the, where there's alignment is the last competency of knowledge and competence commitment. This is where white employees and employees of color uh, both rated the county very strong in terms of knowledge and competence commitment overall. Uh, and also, uh, they're, they're really both in alignment. They're both in consensus. The largest gap is data and disparities. Um, white employees of the county uh, have a give a stronger rating of hey the county's collecting data they're analyzing data to see if there's inequities um, the employees of color um, rated the county lower in terms of those same questions um, whether or not whether there's a disconnect in communication or, or, or what what's being uh, done or what, what's being communicated about the data so that's important to look at uh, so it's always important to break out the data and disaggregate as much as possible to get a feel if there's consensus. Now the reason why you want to do that is because sometimes the results can be skewed. For example, if an organization is largely homogeneous, meaning let's say largely uh, men or largely whites and very small minority populations, if you just took the average and you asked them questions and you took the average, uh, because they're a large makeup of the, of the group, they would skew the results. So if you broke it out by what do, how do uh, white employees think, how do black, Hispanic, Native Americans, you might see uh, blind spots in the data uh, when you break it out rather than having, having it all in one particular group. So it's always important to disaggregate the data to, to, to really uh, make sure there's no blind spots. Um, so this is important to be able to look at. What was the consensus between the racial uh, ethnicity groups um, for, this, for this particular uh, piece of data? At the bottom of the page here, just kind of shows you based on how large the gaps were, what the priorities should look like based upon this data. So the highest priority uh, for the county based on this data and race consensus would be data and disparities as well as capacity building. Those are the uh, lowest scores and is also where uh, the greatest um, 
the, the greatest uh, divergence, uh, the greatest gap uh, for white employees and employees of color, data and disparities and capacity building. Uh, but the county can really leverage its strength for belonging and inclusion and knowledge and competence commitment. So again, what this tells us is that white employees and employees of color both have a strong sense of belonging and inclusion for the county. And that's a strength that really can be leveraged as well into some other areas. All right, now we will look at page uh, 23. In your report, page 23. Page 23 just shows you how did white employees, how did their score change from 2021 to 2023? As you can see, there's um, very little change. Uh, as you can see overall in the results from 2021 to 2023 overall, there's very little change in the score. So white employees pretty much said the same thing in 2023 that they said in 2021. Um, and all the, pretty much on all the different um, uh, competencies. As you can see, there's very minimal, very marginal change in their responses. Um, so it's almost, you could, you could almost interpret this as, you know, white employees are saying that pretty much what, was, what we were doing in 2021 is about the same thing we're doing in 2023, okay? And then if you look at the next page for people of color, you pretty much get the same thing. <laughs> so white employees and employees of color are pretty much saying what we were doing in 2021 in terms of racial equity is about the same thing we're doing in 2023 because their responses are pretty much the same, okay? And you can see it very 0 0.05, 0 0.06, so very, very minimal difference in change in their responses. Okay. All right. Now, what we'll do is we'll look at report page 27, and we'll see how this impacts the overall commitment score for the county in 2023. Now, keep in mind, this is the race consensus score. We put a, drew an X through the aggregate score of 3.72 because that does not factor in the race consensus. Remember, the race consensus is not just how all employees think in the county as a whole, how do white employees and employees of color think, and then factoring in is there, is there a strong consensus or is there substantial significance, and then making sure that that's factored into the scoring. And as you see here for year 23, the county, uh, for year 2023, the county's overall racial equity commitment score is 3.59. In 2021, it was 3.54. So we didn't go backwards, but we really did not move forward uh, very much as well. So there's, um, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to think now that the next time we wanna do a survey like this, we really wanna make sure that we begin to operationalize and really um, take, create some more, take, have some action in place. I'm gonna have some recommendations as well because we don't wanna keep taking these surveys and employees are getting survey fatigue and they're feeling like, hey, nothing's really happening. Why should I even take this survey again? Because uh, we had a strong participation rate in the survey and we wanna be able to keep that. But employees are more likely to respond to surveys if they feel like things are changing or we're taking action on it. Otherwise, they look at it as a ceremonial exercise and they won't waste their time on doing it. We're gonna shift now to looking at uh, what we call disparity analysis in employment. Okay. On uh, page 39 in your report. Okay. Now, There's four different columns in this table. Um, the far left column just shows you, it's just racial ethnic groups, uh, normal census groups by race ethnicity. And then the next column shows you the availability for qualified employees in local government, what's called availability metro counties. So if you look at people who can work, uh, who are qualified, who are either working in local government or are looking for employment in local government, this is the racial makeup of those groups in the counties, what we call reasonable recruitment area, which is a combination of different counties. 
see, the uh, Kenosha County's recruitment area is not just Kenosha County because there are employees who live outside of Kenosha County but also work for the county. So what we did was we looked to see where were the majority of employees working in, 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 uh, in certain counties. And we also, to make, we have to understand that uh, there are a lot of employees or potential employees that are willing to drive up to you know, one hour each way um, to work for uh, an organization. So that's called the county's reasonable recruitment area. And that was a combination of the counties that you see uh, in the bottom here of, of the, um, uh, in the footnote under the table. And so when we look at that, we see what the availability of, uh, of, the, um, of the qualified workforce is. We compare that to the availability of Kenosha County itself. And then the last column, we look to see this is the actual representation of the Kenosha County workforce. It's about 80% white and 20% people of color. So if you're doing a disparity and an equity analysis, you'd want to say, hey, our, our, the current representation of Kenosha County is 80% white, 20% 20 20 people of color. How does that compare to the availability of qualified um, uh, potential workers uh, who are in our reasonable recruitment area? And as you can see there, it's 70% uh, 70 white, 30% people of color. So it just, what, it, what this shows is, is that there is an opportunity for the county to really expand its outreach. There's a lot of qualified talent out here that if the county was able to expand its outreach, um, it may be able to tap into some other uh, uh, talent from a lot of different groups. Now, when you look at these numbers up here, it's really important to understand. This is where some misconceptions come in as it relates to racial equity. Um, the availability for the metro counties at 70%, these aren't quotas. Quotas are illegal. Aspirational goals are what's recommended. Okay? And what this is saying is, wow, you know, if we look at our applicant pool, let's say if we look at our applicant pool for you know, managers of any, different, of any job group, any department, and if we look at our applicant pool, we say, man, our applicant pool is largely one group, one group, one group. But we know, based on the availability of this data, there's other groups out there that are very diverse that we might be missing out on and we're not able really to select the best candidate because we're only getting one group over and over. Now why are we getting one group over and over? Well a lot of organizations have something called employee referral programs, either formal or informal. Uh, they're very cost effective, they're very, uh, employees are usually more loyal, they stay longer. So employee referral, employee referral programs are great. But the only consequence of having an employee referral program, either formal or informal, is that if your organization is largely homogeneous, meaning largely one group or one gender, because of our society is very segregated. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin's top three uh, most segregated cities in the United States. Uh, I haven't looked at the segregation data for Kenosha County, but all over the United States, we're very racially segregated in where we live. The only consequence of that is that people are segregated in where they live, they're segregated in where they go to school, they're segregated in where they go to church, and their social and professional networks also become very segregated. It doesn't mean people are racist, it just means that's just the structure that we live in. Now, because most jobs, 50 to 70% of jobs, as you all know this, are distributed through not what you know necessarily education, but who you know, that means that some groups may not hear about certain jobs versus other groups, and then some groups may be able to put in a good word, pass on a resume, et cetera. So there's consequences based on those types of structures. Um, and so what this tells us is that in order to make sure the county is getting the best qualified talent, we want to expand our pool to be able to have white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, and then select the best candidate from, a, from an expanded pool of talent. Otherwise, we may just be getting talent from people whose friends or family members or people just who know people. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best uh, qualified talent that we could be getting. Okay? So that's something to, to kind of really think about, comparing our representation of our workforce to the qualified available workforce and seeing what there's a gap and how large that gap is. On page 40, next page on your report, we did a, remember I told you that disparities don't necessarily mean anything unless they are significant disparities. So the graph on, page, on this page shows you for the overall Kenosha County workforce. Now, if you just look at, start look at, uh, at one, the 100% threshold, the, the line that's right at 100%. That line represents what's called parity. So parity would be this. If 
30% of Kenosha County's workforce were men, and the availability of qualified candidates for local, county, local government jobs is 30% men, then that means in Kenosha is employing 30% men, and the availability is 30% men, they would be right at parity. Right, that ratio 30 is, is one to one. That's at parity. Now, anything below 100% is underrepresentation of, of a group. Anything above 100% is above parity. That's overrepresentation of a group. So you see in this uh, Kenosha County data, uh, white employees are 16% overrepresented based upon their um, availability in the, in the labor market. Uh, black employees are right slightly uh, above being significantly underrepresented. That dotted line, that 80%, that's what we were gonna refer to as the 80% rule. This is a rule that was uh, a quick test to see how large a disparity is. So the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has a quick test to see if a disparity is substantial. And what they do is um, they use this 80% rule. Um, and then they'll, they'll compare these disparities of, this is my workforce, this is the availability, if I divide those two, is it below that 80% threshold? That's a quick test to see how, how significant or substantial disparity is. So anything below 80% is a significant disparity and would trigger an, a racial inequity. And equity is a significant disparity. Um, so as you can see, for Asians, Asian Americans, uh, Asian employees is the most significant racial disparity, the racial inequity that we have uh, at 22.9%, way below the 80% threshold, as well as Hispanic and two or more races. Okay. This is overall workforce representation. Um, and we kind of put a, a definition of how this is calculated. You can be able to look at that as well in the left-hand column there as well. So remember. There's a disparity, just a difference, but if that difference is significant, we would classify that as a racial inequity if it's below that 80% threshold. Now let's look at management positions. Now we, we actually did this report, the full report has all seven job categories, but just to maximize our time, we just looked at really the overall workforce and really some of the most important positions are management positions. These are the positions that usually pay more salary, have more influence, power, and authority. So on page 43 in your report, uh, this shows us uh, which groups are over and underrepresented in terms of management positions. The, uh, the, this is a job category that the EEOC uses called officials and administrators. So every, employ every uh, employer a municipality that has 100 or more employees is required by federal law to submit the representation of their workforce by race, ethnicity, and gender every two years. So that, that was the data that we used for the report as well. And then we compared that to the availability of qualified um, workers in the labor pool. And for management, we find that white employees are slightly overrepresented at 110%. Uh, black, employee, black employees are overrepresented uh, by 33%. And then we see uh, in management, we're not showing 0% of Asian American uh, professionals. And uh, Hispanic employees and two more races are also significantly underrepresented in management or supervisor positions, all the way up to senior level executive positions. Now, I'll, I'll reemphasize what I said earlier about this. Um, this does not necessarily mean that, okay, we need to obviously go out now and we need to be intentional about just hiring Asians and hiring Hispanics. Well, no, remember, we're not, we don't discriminate against people just because we want to get, we, we see there's racial inequities for this particular group. What this saying is that there's an opportunity to expand our, our outreach. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean we stop advertising on LinkedIn or Indeed if we're getting white candidates coming in. We keep doing that. We don't want to say, oh, we got too many white employees, let's stop advertising over there and let's start going to the Asian American Professional Association, right? No, you advertise LinkedIn and Indeed so you continue to get the white candidates, but you also advertise to the Asian American Professional Association, Native American, the black, and then you increase that pool and then you allow people to compete and you select the best qualified candidate for the job. That's what we want. That's what's doing what's best for the county, 
the county wants to get the best talent as possible for the money, the, the, the amount of resources that we spend on personnel. On page 41, wait, did I? Oh, did I go backwards on you all? Mm -hmm. I apologize. <laughs> all right. Uh, DI best practices gap analysis. The DI best practices gap analysis shows you of the 14 best practices, uh, it shows you where the county stands in terms of indicators in terms of practices being present and effective. And I won't read through all of these, but some of these you can see where the county is reinforcing practices, having a dedicated position uh, responsible for uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, have a diversity officer. Uh, this is one of the most, um, the strongest indicators, the strongest indicators of really being able to advance this work. Uh, 30 years of research tell us that when organizations have a dedicated full-time position that manages and oversees racial equity, diversity, inclusion, things improve and get better. Um, the level, the playing field gets uh, better. People are more cautious about their decisions of showing favoritism or anything else when they know that someone is monitoring how they make decisions. When there's a task force or a committee in place, those are two key what we call accountability structures. Okay. Uh, there's something about human, human beings. When human beings kind of know that they're being watched, they tend to alter or change their behavior because they, they, be, they don't want to seem like they're not being fair or showing favoritism. So they tend to be more cautious when they think about who they, versus a tap on the shoulder promotion versus saying, hey, this person will be promoted because the performance evaluation, this, this, and that. So those things tend to change because when people start watching uh, their behavior. Collecting data, we're really strong there as well. Collecting data uh, on applicants and current employees. And we have some things that we're establishing and that are in progress uh, as well in terms of having DEI action plans, uh, doing more disparity and inequity analysis in other areas. For example, purchasing and procurement services and programs. Uh, and really engaging senior leaders in, in goal setting uh, as well because Racial equity, diversity, inclusion is not just one department's job. It's not just human resources' job. Uh, remember, every, if every department is probably hiring people, promoting people, paying people, and purchasing goods and services. So uh, there's not too many departments that should not have you thinking about are they doing that in a way that is fair and equitable for everyone and all stakeholders of the county. Um, and so there are also some opportunities where some practices are not present, inactive, or undetermined here as well. And you'll see where there's the open circle on some of those where the county has some opportunity to really uh, uh, consider uh, some of those best practices as well. This is not just a checklist, though. This is not just a checklist of saying, hey, did we do all 14 of these? Um, it also depends on just the county as a whole. I'll give you an example. Uh, number 11 says a formal mentoring program available for all employees. <laughs> Now, that best practice may or may not necessarily need to be implemented. I'll tell you why. Um, that best practice is primarily recommended for organizations that if they have a diverse overall uh, workforce, but all the diversity is kind of at the bottom, and there's really only one group that's dominant at the top, that's probably telling us is that there's not a lot of there's not pathways to promotion. There's probably, there's probably mentoring taking place, but it's probably more informal mentoring. It's probably in-group favoritism. You know, uh, managers may mentor people who are kind of like them. Maybe they go play golf with, or maybe they go to happy hour with, things like that. But when formal mentoring programs are put in place, and they're formal, we tend to see women and we tend to see racial minorities move up because they get exposure. Their talent gets exposed to different groups. They begin to interact more, and they become more familiar with people who are in the top positions as well, and that's where you tend to see things kind of level out versus just people just kind of mentoring who they like and who they're comfortable and familiar with. Um, so, but here's the thing, if we see uh, uh, equities, if we see equity in those top positions, then we may not need a formal mentoring program because we're doing something right if we see at all levels of our workforce, we see uh, diversity uh, at all levels. So we, we would need to implement a formal mentor program in that particular case. So these are just the suite of best practices that we see uh, that, we, that we know based on research are effective. 
And as we get ready to close it out um, on our last page here, uh, some recommendations and next steps. Continue to reinforce uh, being a committed institution and really focus on implementing the best practices. Uh, develop and expand capacity for data gathering. And I don't, believe this, I don't believe you have this last slide included in the report. This is just for me to kind of just give you all some recommendations and next steps here as well. <clears throat> uh, really want to continue the data gathering, identifying opportunities uh, and impediments to, it, to advancing racial equity. Uh, really leverage the recommendations of the diversity task force and other stakeholders to identify and implement certain policies and practices that advance DEI. It's really something that needs to be done, like a DEI SWOT analysis to identify what policies and practices may be unintentionally, kind of like an employer fraud program, unintentionally sustaining these inequities that we see. We don't see a lot of policies and practices that intentionally exclude women or intentionally exclude LGBTQ plus or intentionally exclude racial minorities. There's a lot of unintentional policies and practices that you don't even have, you don't have to have racism or sexism, they're just gonna sustain the inequities anyway, just because how things are structured. Uh, continue to develop DEI action plans. What gets measured usually gets done, old management cliche, uh, but when it's a plan and it's written down and there's accountability in place for departments, um, things tend to move and make progress uh, as well. And then conducting disparity analysis for utilization and barriers to access. How do we know if all of our stakeholders, residents, have uh, equal access to services and programs? If you don't have data, all you have is an opinion. <laughs> so we want to be able to see if we have data on that uh, as well. Who's utilizing our programs, who's not, and what are some reasons why, what, what are some barriers? Uh, and then last, the last two, conducting uh, disparity and equity analysis for the representation of vendors and contractors. Um, I can't tell you this, every municipality that I've worked with whether it's been cities and towns in Massachusetts, Arlington County right outside of DC, Tarrant County and Fort Worth, every municipality we work with, we always see the greatest inequities are in employment and purchasing and procurement. Uh, a lot of resources, a lot of dollars, money is spent in those areas uh, and there's usually some significant inequities in those particular areas as well. And then just continue to monitor progress in becoming a committed institution. What we really want is, as, I, as my time uh, finishes here, is that um, when the county gets ready to take this next audit assessment, um, we really want to be able to see some progress, and that really can't happen unless we kind of follow some of these recommendations, have an action plan in place, and get all department leaders on board. They've got support from diversity officers, a diversity task force. Now the county just wants to maximize the return on this investment by making sure that there's some work being done and things are moving forward. Uh, and so with that, I want to thank you all again for this time and uh, looking forward to checking in on you all on this journey uh, as you all do what's best for the county. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we're going to have an update now on the Human Services Building Project. Uh, the reason... Uh, put it in the agenda as uh, you see on the county board agenda it's going to be a resolution that is going to be sent to finance and I wanted to give the opportunity to everyone to know ahead of time what to expect and then uh, again we're not going to take any questions now but uh, you will have plenty of time to ask uh, finance if you need to or uh, at the finance committee the next finance committee Okay, with this year, who's gonna do it, Petty? Good evening, Chairman Nudo, Vice Chair Decker, and members of the County Board. This evening, we have a brief presentation on the Human Services Building Project. The goal of this presentation is to bring you up to date on what's happening with the project, the projected cost, and the next steps. As Chairman Nudo stated, due to time constraints, we will not be taking questions this evening. Tonight, we'll provide you with information. 
Over the next couple of weeks, you will have opportunities to ask any questions you may have. The current human services building is in dire need of repairs or modifications. The current building is approximately 125,000 square feet, has cramped working environment and lack of privacy for occupants and visitors. The new location provides improved proximity to service delivery and the facility is approximately 147,000 square feet, providing a better layout and room for growth. As many of you are aware, back in 2018, 2019, it became apparent that a decision would need to be made on the human services building. Either rehabilitate the old or build new. In 2020, the Smith Group was hired to do some studies of both the Job Center campus and the Civic Center campus. These studies were presented to various county committees in late 2020. At that time, the cost estimates for both rehabilitation and relocation were very close. Through 2021, there were meetings with neighborhoods, citizens, and local groups to assess interest in relocation. The original site considered for relocation was the pick and save site in the uptown area. Ultimately, that was not a viable option. The second location that was proposed was the Sun Plaza location on 52nd Street. A plan was created, and in February of 2022, the County Board approved a resolution for the project. There were multiple neighborhood and committee meetings and tours to inform various groups about the project components. Also in 2022, Kenosha County was awarded $9.85 million in the Neighborhood Investment Grant by the state. So, uh, <clears throat> an update on where we are now. Mid-2022 uh, to pretty much the beginning of 2023, staff members like Frank, Shelley, uh, John, and I'm sure a few other uh, Kenosha County staff sat with each department and division, uh, along with Partners in Design and Bear, to make sure that we were uh, assessing all the hardships that they deal with in the current building, and then how can we better address that with some needs in the new building? Uh, kind of as Patty said, uh, the cramped space and environment, we don't want to build a new building to move in to outgrow within five years. We want this to last 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, and be able to grow into it. So after uh, that was done and they had value engineered the difference between the wants and the needs. The project went out to bid. Um, there's technically two bid uh, phases of this. Obviously the first one is exactly the amount of the neighborhood grant and then the remainder uh, is put into that second phase, which <clears throat> has totaled up to $25.2 million. Uh, if you add an architect and some vapor expenses, which we'll kind of get to in a little bit, uh, it, the number creeps up closer to 37 million. Um, I know that may shock you, but we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Uh, so where uh, Shelley's done a pretty good job of sending out weekly updates. Um, obviously, you guys know demolition has begun, site work has begun. Uh, value engineering never stops. Anytime that there's a change order or something that comes along, it isn't just approved. It's thoroughly gone through. Do we need it? Is there another way to go about it? Um, and no different than any of the other big projects we have. Anytime we see grants, we're looking into, can this be applied? Um, that brings us to where our estimate of a move-in date, a completion date, is right now looking like the beginning of 2026. So the reasons for some of these cost increases. One of the biggest ones is the numbers that were presented to everybody back in 2020, 2021, obviously these are four or five year old numbers. A lot of this was pre-COVID and everybody knows when COVID hit what happened to all the construction and labor uh, prices. There's an estimate out there that it's roughly 30% increase specifically to the construction market. Um, 
which takes that 16 to 18 million dollars already up to 23 million. That obviously has a domino effect anytime something goes up, there's overhead percentage based fees that also go up with it. Uh, we're also looking at additional square footage. The number that was presented early on was the renovation of the current building as is. It didn't include the additional uh, 22,000 or 18 percent increase of how our current building is and again uh, we've already added the comprehensive community services uh, and there's still area to grow. So along with that comes some additional features uh, that weren't a part of that original discussion. We have the parking lot. Uh, this site is the old site of a uh, dry cleaner laundry mat. Uh, so they're putting in vapor remediation so we don't come into uh, problems down the road. Landscaping, bond insurance, and then some other numbers that wouldn't also be infect, uh, affected are we need new furniture, we need new IT, and then obviously the cost of moving. So a little hard to see, um, but here is a, a comparison of what the original resolution kind of outlined and then where we are today. Purchase of sales, architects, uh, the phase one and phase two obviously doesn't come out to exactly what the numbers were before, but that's because the percentage numbers are uh, based Based, baked into that on the line below. Um, and you'll see revenues also uh, notated below. On the new market grants, there's an asterisk. We are not completely losing that. That number is not zero. However, we don't have a definitive answer for what that number will be. So what that shows is what the worst case scenario would be. Do we not get those tax credits? Uh, so how do we compare? And it's actually pretty good. So if we take into account just the construction, including some of the architect and vapor, you're looking at $248 a square foot. If we take into everything included, not including the, um, the revenue to decrease it, we're looking at $283 a square foot. The city of Kenosha, uh, in coordination with the Kenosha Innovation Center, they're building a roughly $64,000, 64, 64,000 square foot, three-story building, costing roughly $24 million. That comes out to $362 a square foot. Racine County has a behavioral health, roughly 55,000 square feet, again, three stories partially, uh, $27,491 a square foot. Milwaukee, 60,000 square foot, four-story building, roughly $32,533 a square foot. All of these buildings that are presented here are obviously considerably less in square footage and either comparable or much higher in comparison to the cost. So that's kudos to Kenosha County, everybody involved that's been value engineering, negotiating, we're getting a good deal. And where do we go from here? I'll hand it over to Patty. As Chris stated, we're watching for continued opportunities for value engineering. Value engineering basically is, can we change something to make it less expensive without sacrificing quality? There are periodic calls on the project status, and as Chris mentioned, Shelley's been forwarding updates on the project. On the board agenda this evening is a communication for referral to the Finance Administration Committee, an initial resolution for the ultimate purchase of the building. As Chris reported, we anticipate occupancy of the building in early 2026. The lease purchase agreement states we will lease the building for five years, which means we would be purchasing the building in early 2031. With the 2024 budget, the county board passed a capital improvement policy manual. One of the requirements in that policy manual is that any multi-year legacy project must obtain full funding approval through a separate initial resolution. To be in compliance with this policy, we're bringing forward that initial resolution now. An initial resolution is good for five years, which means the initial resolution may need to be renewed before the actual borrowing occurs. 
The initial resolution will be considered by the Finance Committee next week. Representatives will be available at that time to answer questions that you may have, or you can reach out to any of us at any time before that meeting. Thank you for your time this evening. We'll email copies of the PowerPoint to you. Um, in addition, we have a summary document we'll hand out now as we conclude. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Supervisor Berg, second by Supervisor O'Day. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned.